Lord, you're awesome. Lord, we worship you because you're awesome. We magnify you because you're awesome. We lift your name up, O oh God, because you are an awesome God. Lord, let your presence continue to manifest itself in this place today. Lord, we need a word from you. Nobody needs a word from me, Lord, but I need you to speak through me, Heavenly Father. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Search me, O oh God. If there is anything in me that is not like you, I ask you to remove it so that I can be used by you. Father, give me clear thoughts and articulate words that I may say what you have had me to say. Have your way in this place, O oh God, and we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Somebody say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Some of you know that Bishop is recovering from hip replacement surgery, and we will have a more detailed update on him um, a little bit later in the service, uh, as well as this is a special service today is where we are doing uh, towards the end a holiday remembrance to, uh, to let those who have lost loved ones during this year have a chance to, to honor them um, during this holiday season. I have been given a specific assignment regarding the direction I need to go in this morning. See, last week, I, I, I was given the assignment to preach what God laid on my heart to preach. This week, my assignment is to preach what God has laid on our senior pastor, Bishop Johnson's heart. And since I am an associate pastor and not the senior pastor, I'm going to be faithful to God and to my spiritual father by taking us in the direction that Bishop wants to go. See, when Bishop's not here, he's still here. Amen. Amen. As we approach the Christmas season, Bishop received clear direction from God regarding what we needed to hear preached for Christmas. Considering that we just finished a series on the scandal of the cross, on top of that, since Wednesday, June 20th, we have been preaching a Wednesday series entitled, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. And even prior to that, Bishop did 31 messages under the title, Will the Real God Please Stand Up? In those three sermon series, Bishop taught directly and also indirectly that God the Father did not desire, nor did he demand, the death of his dearly beloved son. Furthermore, Jesus was not sadomasochistic and wanted to die, yet all that we have been taught is that God required Jesus to die for the sins of the world. And we've been taught that Jesus came specifically to die, even though that this was not the doctrinal teaching of the church for his first 1,100 years. This raises a very pertinent and powerful question. If God didn't desire or demand Jesus' death, and Jesus didn't come into the world primarily or only to die, then why did Jesus come to the world? As we look at the biblical reasons that Jesus came into the world, we also have a list of reasons then to celebrate Christmas. Because Christmas is the celebration of the coming of God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus the Christ. So why did Jesus come? It is very difficult to rank these reasons in terms of importance, so I will list them in a loose order of importance. In fact, there are so many reasons that Jesus came, I'm only limiting it to 20 reasons. Don't worry, that won't be all this service. Today, we're just going to deal with the first five. And remember, the grand majority of these reasons have nothing to do with paying a debt. So let's move right in and look at reason number one. There's no reason to stand this morning because we're going to be working through so many verses. No need to keep getting up and getting back down. So let's just jump right into reason number one is that Jesus came to do the will of the Father. 
The Bible says in John chapter 6, verses 38 through 39, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. It is interesting and also short-sighted that American evangelical religion flows almost exclusively around Jesus and does that at the expense of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus repeatedly over and over again acknowledges the fact that he came to do the will of the Father, which was to save people, and Jesus also states that he would lose none that were given to him, but he will raise them up on the last day. The A clause of verse 38 really jumps out to me and it actually takes my mind straight to the writings of Paul in his letter to the church in Philippi where he states that being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. See, see, I love how these, these passages connect that reason that God sent Jesus with the method that was required for Jesus to be successful at what God was calling him to do. See, right out of the gate, we see that Jesus humbled himself and came down. The Bible tells us, he who is greatest among you will be servant of all. And here we see Jesus' servant mentality is not only a requirement for us, but it was also a requirement of Jesus as well. Jesus made a voluntary and intelligent decision to descend into this world. This was a long journey. It was a deep step down from where Jesus was. In fact, this is a summary of the gospel, if you will, because Jesus, the bread of life, came down from heaven. And those who feed on the bread of life will be raised up on the last day. See, the Bible, the Bible has a very interesting way of stating something that's very complex as a very matter-of-fact thing. But, but beneath the surface, when it says that Jesus came down, there's a lot to Jesus coming down. And it is actually implied in this passage everything that was required for Jesus to come down. See, to come down, Jesus had to empty himself. To come down, Jesus had to become poor. To come down, Jesus had to take on the form of a servant. To come down, Jesus had to wrap himself in flesh. To come down, Jesus had to come through 42 generations, be born through the womb of a peasant virgin named Mary just to come down. Somebody should give God some praise this morning that Jesus came down. I don't want to think about where I would be if Jesus had not did what he had to do in order to come down. All of this, though, was in preparation for Jesus to come and do the will of the Father. Jesus came to earth on a mission from the Father. Jesus came not seeking his own private agenda, but Jesus was on a mission to recover the lost sheep of his fold. Jesus was on a mission to recover the lost coins of humanity. God came manifest in the flesh, being found in the appearance of man because he was not simply a man, but he was God-man and man-God. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to God and his mission to the point of death, even death on the cross. It is clear to me from all of this that God didn't require Jesus to give his life, but Jesus voluntarily became obedient to God and the mission to the point of death on the cross. He chose to go all the way to the cross to complete the mission that he had been given by God. The world and the devil required Jesus' death, but Jesus voluntarily submitted to that death. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Reason number two, Jesus came to reveal God. John tells us in chapter 1, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. 
See, here in verse 18, John is bringing the prologue of his book to a close, in which he has tied Jesus not only to the work of creation found in Genesis chapter 1, but he has also connected Jesus to being the source of light and life in this world. And it's on the heels of drawing this connection that John makes this stunning declaration about Jesus. No one has seen God in the flesh at any time. When this is combined then with the ancient Near Eastern thought that created the way they framed the, their view of life, we find that the Israelites believed that anyone who saw God would die. But see, this is not the case with the God of Israel. The God of Israel was coming to this world as a heavenly missionary, desiring that those he comes in contact with will see the Father in the way that Jesus meets us right where we are just for the purpose of walking patiently with us to bring us into a full and complete understanding of who God really is. Jesus came to explain God to us like nobody else can. Jesus came to explain God to us through the perfect embodiment of a kingdom lifestyle. This provided us then with a more complete understanding of who God is because Jesus became, came to explain the Father. For in Jesus, you see then that automatically you see the Father. Consequently, Jesus, we have the latest and greatest revelation of God. Jesus revealed to us the forgiving and non-loving God. Jesus revealed to us the indiscriminately loving and long-suffering God. By the way, this creates a tremendous discontinuity between the seemingly violent God of the Old Testament and the non-violent Jesus of the New Testament. But Jesus, he was the only begotten God who was born in the bosom of the Father. We know who God is because of Jesus. See, some manuscripts call, say, the only begotten Son, but, but John amends this phrase to read the only begotten God to highlight the deity of the Son. Remember, it was John that said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is showing us that that the Son and the Father are one. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the power of his word. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. God spoke in many ways across the annals of time, but in these last days of the text, God spoke to us in his son. His, his son was the appointed heir of all things. His son was the one through whom God made the earth. The son is the radiance of the father. The son is the exact representation of the nature of God, upholding all things in the power of his word, made the purification of sin, and is seated at the right hand of majesty on high. God came, Jesus came, to reveal God to us. Moving on to reason number three, Jesus came to fulfill the law of the prophets. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets by revealing to us what they were really all about. But that begs the question, what were the law and the prophets about? They were about the love and the relationship with God the Father and one's neighbor. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40 says it like this, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Jesus fulfilled the law by showing us in his life what it means to live by the great commandment to love God with all your heart 
and your neighbor as yourself. In fact, this is very aggressive language in the original because it carries a connotation of doing this at all times in every situation without any limits, no matter how someone treats you, no matter how you feel, no matter what's going on, loving God with all that you are and your neighbor as yourself. This has been a struggle for humanity down through the years. It has been a struggle because of the complexity and the messiness that is often inherent within human relationships. Uh, it's because it is that people have often sought the service of God at the expense of service to their brothers and sisters. See, since the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden and rivalry was introduced into the earth, man struggled with the connection between how we treat our brothers and sisters and the direct correlation this has in regards to our relationship with God. Ask your neighbor, what does love have to do with this? It, it has everything to do with this. Because we've been studying on Wednesday night that God allowed the law as a substitute, catch this, because of a lack of love. The truth of the matter is that God never wanted a relationship with us that was based on law and sacrifices. But God has always wanted and has always desired a relationship with us that is based on and fueled by love. Therefore, Jesus came to fulfill the true intent of the law by demonstrating to us what it looks like to have a relationship with God and with one another that is fueled by love. See, Jesus healed on the Sabbath to show us, the church, that we can't worship God and not show any compassion to those who are suffering. Jesus fed the 5,000 to show us that the church can't care about the soul without also ministering to the body. Jesus turned over the, ta the, the money changers' tables in the temple to show us, the church, that we cannot turn a blind eye to economic oppression. Essentially, Jesus came to fulfill the law through a faith walk that understood how to give proper emphasis to the form and the function of our relationship with God. In other words, what this means is that we don't emphasize the law at the expense of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Reason number four. Jesus came to demonstrate the love of God. Y'all know this verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, throughout John's gospel, there is an undercurrent, an ongoing concern for life. And this passage not only then speaks of the duration of life, but it also speaks to the quality of life. Jesus came that we might have a better quality of life. See, it is a life that God lives and that the Son has for the Father. In fact, this life emerges as Jesus bowed his head on the cross and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, see Jesus' final breath is in fact a new breath of life in surpassing quality to the original breath of life that was breathed on humanity in Jesus. Jesus came bearing within himself the gift of new life. Ah, uh, this reminds me of those times when I am exhausted and ready to give up. The struggle and trial has sometimes taken my mental and physical strength and have gotten me to the point where I wanted to give up. But it's in those moments, out of nowhere, I can't explain it, that I get the strength to take another step. I've uh, I've had days when the competing demands of life have gotten the best of me and I was losing on every front and I was ready to walk away and from everything and from everybody. But when I did, I felt the strength to carry on out of nowhere, to take another step. See, this is the evidence of the new life that Jesus has made available to us. Jesus came that we might not perish but have eternal life. The contrast between temporal life and age-long life in which Jesus came that both aspects of life would be renewed. 
See, look at how in Romans this, this love is demonstrated to us. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's another one of those times where the Bible says something that's very complex in a very matter-of-fact and simple kind of way. Jesus came to demonstrate the love of God. God demonstrated his love for us in the fact that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners, still sinning, in the act of sinning. God sent Jesus on a mission, and Jesus came and died in keeping with that mission. Jesus didn't wait until we demonstrated some progress or some movement in the right direction. But he died for us while we were sinners. Sometimes I think that we get so familiar with passages like this that, that the weight of these words often escape us. Jesus died for us. Not when we displayed the most redeemable qualities, but Jesus died for us when we displayed the least redeemable qualities. Jesus didn't come for the best version of who we are, but Jesus came for the worst version of who we are. Jesus came and died for the version that's hateful and jealous. Jesus came and died for the version that lies without thinking about it. Jesus came and died for the version that lusts after somebody else's spouse. Jesus came and died for the version that's addicted to pornography. Jesus came and died for the version that was promiscuous. Jesus came and died for the version that would do anything just to make an extra buck. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be the righteousness of Christ. If that's not a reason to shout this morning, I don't know what is. If that's not a reason to glorify the Lord, I don't know what is. If that's not a reason to bless his holy name, I don't know what is. If that's not a reason to magnify the God of your salvation, I don't know what is. Jesus came to demonstrate God's love. Next, we have our fifth and final reason for the day, that Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. John 18, verse 37 through 38 says, Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. Jesus came to testify or bear witness to the truth. See, an understanding that, that Jesus came to bear witness to the truth is of particular importance given the current context that the church is in. For we are finding ourselves having to minister within a postmodern context of conceptual relativism, where absolute truth does not exist. The intellectuals of this age have tried to kill truth and kill God at the same time. See, there was, if there was ever a time in humanity where we needed to know the truth, the truth is now. We are faced with a world of fake news and alternative facts, selfie sound bites and memes. In the midst of all of this noise, in the midst of all of this confusion, in the midst of this staged reality on social media, we are forced to ask the same question that Pilate asked, what is the truth? It is in this passage we hear the voice of Jesus as one crying in the wilderness against the backdrop of this cultural dilemma where we hear the clarion call of Jesus that I have come to testify to the truth. Jesus goes on to state that everyone who is of the truth hears his voice. For sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. Unfortunately, Pilate treats 
the truth of Jesus as relative or as one possible option among many alternatives, while Jesus treats the truth as absolute. Because Jesus not only came to bear witness to the truth, but Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth itself. Jesus bears witness to the truth because he and the truth are one. Jesus is the full and final revelation of God. See, ever since Adam believed the lies of the devil, ever since then, man has been groping in ignorance, looking for truth in all the wrong places. Some, some are looking for truth in the halls of higher education thinking that more degrees will translate into a better grasp of the truth. Others are looking for truth in politics, thinking that they are affiliated with the correct political platform. They will then have a correct grasp on the truth. Some are seeking truth by looking for higher spiritual knowledge found in various religions. They have determined that if they have a cursory understanding of multiple religions, then they will have a handle on the truth. Some have decided that the study of philosophy and the writings of intellectuals from different periods and histories, if, if they understand that, then they will have a grasp of the truth. There are those that believe that they will find the truth in the study of sociology. If they can understand how we interact with each other and deal with each other, then they will have an understanding of the truth. Some have decided that science is where they will find the truth. If a truth claim isn't backed by science, then it can't be truth. But the problem with this is, the problem is that we are not talking about a truth. We are talking about the truth. See, while, while there is some truth that can be found in these various pursuits, but there are not complete truths. See, the truth is not found in education or religious systems. The truth can only be found in Jesus the Christ. In Jesus are hid the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Jesus is the complete embodiment of truth. Jesus is a complete manifestation of truth. Jesus is the personification of truth. Jesus is truth for all eternity. Jesus is past truth. Jesus is present truth. Jesus is future truth. Jesus is absolute truth. The truth of Jesus is truth for all people in all places at all times. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth because the truth will set us free. Jesus is the truth. So back, back to our original question. Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Jesus came to reveal God. Jesus came to fulfill the law and prophets. Jesus came to demonstrate the love of God. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. This is what Christmas is all about. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I would like to give someone an opportunity to meet the Jesus who came on a mission to earth, sent by the Father to save us. See, this was the goal of the reasons why Jesus came, that, that he would make a way for us to have a relationship with him. If there is someone in here today and you know that God has been speaking to your heart and pulling on your heart to come to him, this is your time. If this is you, please play this prayer with me. Lord, I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed against you. Please come into my heart and make me into the person you want me to be. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. And please, I'm sorry for my sins. If you prayed this prayer... I want to give you an opportunity to make your new life public because now you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We have altar workers down front that would love to pray with you and welcome you in to the family of Christ. Also, during this time, if you are here and you're looking for a church home, 
We would love to have you as a part of our family, as a part of our tribe. And altar workers are here this morning that you can come down and they will welcome you in as well.